Well, good evening, everybody. Welcome to the 16th lecture in this series on history and philosophy of science and 20 objects. Last month, our object was the Bar and Strood Rangefinder, which was a bit of optical weaponry from the era of the First World War. But for us, it functioned as a lens through which to examine three fundamental and overlapping relationships in the history of modern science between science and technology, science and commerce, and science and war. Now, we did our best, but those are weighty themes. Uh, so it's the more pleasurable now to ascend to the sunlit uplands, where we consider and said science and art. That's our theme this evening. Uh, our objects are rather splendid and varied and different. They come from the life and work of someone that many of us know only as the name on a building, which is what happens when you succeed in science. Uh, her name was Irene Manson. She was a fellow of the Royal Society. You'll be hearing an awful lot about her. And she embodies uh, a, a number of the points that our lecturers are going to be making tonight about the productive relationships between science and art. Uh, our lecturers are Nicola Williams, who is a PhD student specializing in the history of science, Alice Murphy, a PhD student specializing in the philosophy of science, and Stephen French, professor of the philosophy of science. So join me now, please, in welcoming them. I'm just going to start with the uh, brief, brief biography on Irene Manson. Um, so this is a brief introduction to Irene Manson and the first half of her career with a look at her developing interest in microscopy and her first breakthrough cellular discovery. This earlier part of Manson's career is interesting because it maps innovations in microscopy when scientists transitioned from the world of light microscopy to the subcellular, subcellular cellular realm of electron microscopy, where it was the theoretically possible to see to the atomic level of detail, although in practice this would be some time to come. Irene Manton was a cytologist, botanist, microscopist, art collector and curator. She was an important biologist at Leeds. It was here she made fundamental discoveries about the structure of the cell and she was already a leading authority in the evolutionary history of ferns. Manton was the first female professor in science at the University of Leeds and perhaps uh, a UK university um, excluding colleges for women and she was the first woman president of the Linnaean Society of London. To recognise her achievements, the university erected a blue plaque in her name outside Botany House, describing her work in, di in discovering the fundamental features of the cell, knowledge widely important in biology and medicine. Uh, the plaque reads, in this building, Professor Irene Manton, Fellow of the Royal Society, electron microscopist, head of Department of Botany from 1946 until 1969 made fundamental discoveries in cell structure including 9 plus 2 and Golgi function. Um, here we'll talk about the 9 plus 2 in the early 1950s. Uh, the work on the Golgi body of the cell came later in the early 60s. Uh, so this is Botany House um, um, where the, the, the plaque is erected uh, situated on campus. It's the building where Manson worked and also where she placed paintings of well-known artists upon the walls, including the laboratory for the appreciation of students and staff. Um, my colleague Alice will tell you more about this. Um, so this is the Irene Manson building, um, also in, in recognition of her achievements. Um, the, the building is situated next door to the Asprey building after William Asprey, the Leeds biophysicist. Um, Manson, was born in um, Manson was born in Kensington, an upper class suburb of London, in 1904. Her father was a dental surgeon and her mother an embroideress and designer of French aristocratic descent. So she's from quite a posh background. 
In fact, her social status goes some way to explaining how she came to find herself in a position of authority at a time when it was still relatively rare for women to break the glass ceiling. This and her personality, Manton was known to be a force of nature who did not suffer fools gladly. Um, she was also generous, enthusiastic, inspiring with a warm sense of humour. Um, Manton attended St Paul's School, a private girls' day school. Um, other notable alumni of the school in science include Rosalind Franklin, who also later attended the school. Um, Manton developed an interest in nature from an early age. She went often to the Natural History Museum and her parents regularly took her and her sister Sydney, who later became a zoologist, into the countryside where they collected butterflies and were encouraged to draw what they found. Um, so this is a page from Manton's school book when she attended St Paul's, show, showing a drawing of flowers she made, in this case a, a, a crucifer. Um, a family of plants she would later come to work with uh, in Cambridge. Um, here we can detect a developing interest in botany itself for traditionally il illustrative and visual subjects. After this, Manton went to Girton College, Cambridge, where she took her degree in the natural sciences with a focus on botany. Uh, she achieved a double first class degree before continuing on to do her PhD there. Um, these illustrations were drawn by Manton and appeared in a book she would later publish in 1950. Um, on the left is a silhouette of the fern, fern dry, dryopteris and on the right uh, a fruit bearing cruciferous plant, the Biscataea. Um, at Cambridge, Manton's research in chromosome cytology inv inv involved observing chromosomes under the light microscope. Here is a light microscope Manton worked with in Manchester. Manton would count the chromosomes, observe shapes and analyse pairing behaviour during cell division to look for any evidence of abnormality. Then she used this information to map the evolutionary history or phylogeny of the family of plants she was working with, um, in this case the crucifers. Um, so here we can see chromosomes under the microscope during the process of cell division. Um, this is an example of a, a metaphase spread. And here we see um, anaphase with um, chromosomes, chromosomes lagging behind. Um, In 1930, she, gave, she gained her first post as assistant lecturer, then soon, ha soon, soon after, lecturer at the University of Manchester, where she stayed for 16 years. Continuing to work with chromosomes, she started working with a different group of plants, the ferns, and she developed an interest in chromosome structure. These images of the chromosome structure were published in the journal Nature in 1936. Her interest continued alongside innovations in microscopy, which enabled biologists to see further inside the cell. Um, during the war, she used a more powerful microscope, the ultraviolet microscope, to look at chromosomes. And at this time, she dreamed of using the electron microscope, which had been invented in the 30s, but was not yet widely available in the UK. After the war ended, Manton was invited to a professorship at the University of Leeds on account of her scientific achievements in phylogeny and also her innovative work on the spiral structure of chromosomes. Uh, throughout her career, she continued to work on firm phylogeny and developed am ambitions to map the firm flora in various places across the globe. When she became interested in the Chinese flora in the late 1950s, it spurred an interest in oriental art and other ways of looking at nature. Um, again, my colleague Alice will tell you more about this. Uh, this, is, this is Manson um, on the front row behind her, uh, her colleague Reginald Preston. And I think on the table there, there is, there is um, a copy of this picture and there's a, a key under, underneath if anyone's interested in, in um, looking, looking through that later. 
Um, Manton, Manton didn't at the time um, continue to work with chromosomes which were fiddly to prepare and difficult to view under electron microscopy. She instead switched to another type of fiber, the cilia or flagella, which was easier to work with. Um, Manton was involved in obtaining the first electron microscope for the botany department, the Philips EM100, a transmission electron mi microscope which was uh, installed in 1950. Um, in tra transmission <coughs> electron microscopy, the electron beam passes through the specimen and is viewed on a phosphorescent screen. Um, my colleague Stephen will tell you more about this. Um, as, we can, as you can see from the slide, it was shaped a bit like an office desk. Um, at the time, it was the only botany department in the world to have an electron microscope. Um, it was using this instrument that Manton discovered the classic 9 plus 2 structure of cilia in a plant cell. Um, this iconic image is, is taken from the front cover of Manton's 1950 book, um, Problems of Cytology and Evolution in the Pteridophyta, and is symbolic of the beginnings of her career in analyzing the fine structure or the sub light microscopic structure of cells. Um, this is a plant sperm cell where you can see many hair like structures, the, the, cili the cilia. Um, the cilia contain a core bundle of fibers now known as microtubules. Um, many cells contain a single non-motile cilium while others contain large numbers that perform repeated beating movements. Uh, at this time, it wasn't possible to view the internal structure of cilia intact and details could only be view viewed in um, 2D using the transmission electron microscope. Um, Manton's achievement, therefore, was to describe the internal structure of the cilia pictorially, pictorially and in three, three dimension, three, and three-dimensionally. Um, Manton built on her extensive knowledge in microscopy and used the light, ultraviolet and electron microscopes together in conjunction to make the discovery, um, which she then published in 1952. Um, because Manton was an evolutionary botanist, she surveyed the structure in a range of organisms, from tiny algae um, to the cells of larger plants, mosses and ferns. She discovered it to be a common structural feature of plant cells in general and therefore, and, and before long other researchers discovered it to be common uh, to animal cells too. Um, it became possible to capture um, a two-dimensional cross-section of the 9 plus 2 with, with electron microscopy around two years after Manton first described the composite structure in plants. Um, in this slide, we can see a cross-section of the structure, um, nine microtubules uh, surrounding a central pair of micro microtubules. Um, the Leeds Botany Department had an international reputation in electron microscopy in the 1950s, and Manton and colleagues continued to make further discoveries in cellular, cellular structure. Uh, in 1961, um, she was elected Fellow of the Royal Society, along with her sister, fellow scientist and zoologist Sydney, Sydney Manton, who, who was elected in 1948. Uh, they're, they're the only two siblings to have achieved such a fate. Um, to celebrate this fact, the two sisters have a crater on the planet Venus named in, in their honour. <laughs> in addition to this, uh, and uh, the recognition she later received from, from Leeds. She received many accolades throughout her career, including awards from the Linnaean Society of London, honorary, member <laughs> honorary membership of learned societies, for example, the Royal Microscopical Society, honorary degrees. Um, the slide shows Manton at her honorary graduation ceremony in Lancaster with Barbara Colson, a friend and colleague from her days at Manchester. Um, my colleague Alice will now talk about representation in art and science. Okay, so now that Nicola's told us about Manton's life and career, I'm going to focus on her fascination with art.
Mums then collected a huge variety of both original works and prints over her lifetime. Many of these were displayed in Botany House here at Leeds next to her electron micrographs. And are now over at Lancaster Gallery who very kindly um, gave us some information about her collection for the purpose of this talk. Munson saw her collection not as fine art, but as working tools with which a scientist endeavours to comprehend certain aspects of the world which are not science. And she coined the term that is the theme of the talk, other ways of looking at nature. This captures her view that the boundaries between scientific and artistic representations of the world are not always so easily defined. So before I get to why this idea is really interesting for philosophers of art and science who think about representation, I'll start by going through some of Manton's artwork. So she had an interest in the ways in which Western artists had appropriated themes and styles in non-Western art in the late 19th and early 20th centuries, particularly Japanese and Chinese art. The opening of the markets in Japan in the 1850s created a shift in Western tastes towards Japanese aesthetic principles and motifs. Many Western artists learned about Japanese aesthetics through woodblock prints, and the example here is from Hokusai, whose work Manton had prints of. These two are part of his 36 views of Mount Fuji series. And leading impressionists and post-impressionists took from Japanese works such as these, including Manet, Van Gogh, Gauguin, and also Cezanne. It offered an alternate way of using the picture plane, a different flattened perspective, and shape was emphasised and often a dark outline was used. These features are shown here in Cezanne's landscape and still life. And we can see that the composition mirrors that of Hokusai, um, and Cezanne also produced his own series of views of a specific mountain. And Cezanne was a constant touchstone for Braque and Picasso, the two major artists in the development of Cubism, which began around 1907 and was a definitive moment in Western art. Manton had prints of both of their work and I think they're perfect examples for understanding her policy behind her selection of art. This was to demonstrate the important trends making 20th century painting so different from previous ones. And Cubism turns away from the notion that art should imitate the natural world by rejecting the use of traditional perspective. By breaking down objects into distinct planes, the artist simultaneously displayed different fragmented aspects of the objects depicted, and this formed a radically new means of representation. And early on, Manton had an interest in non-Western art, and we know that she visited the International Exhibition of Chinese Art in 1935 at the Royal Academy of Arts in London. This was a huge event that displayed paintings, sculptures, ceramics and textiles that most Western people would not have had the chance to see before. And this visit went on to impact her choices for the works that she bought. She stated that visitors to Botany House unfamiliar with modern art need to be reminded that the art world, like the world of science, is international and a contemporary artist whose work Manton owned was Lo Shou Quan. He created a new style of Chinese painting called New Inca, which merged Eastern landscape themes with Western abstract expressionism. So the two examples here from Lee Krasner and Franz Klein. Um, an abstract expressionist felt that art should be impulsive, and often their work was comprised of canvases filled with expressive brushstrokes like these two. Okay, so... Continuing this um, cross-cultural influences theme, Manson owned many drawings of Lowry's and some, um, and some prints of his paintings, and this one shows the perspective she liked in Chinese art combined with an industrial scene of northern England. Manson used to display Chinese paintings, such as a fish swimming in water, alongside Western pictures, such as a print of this by Hayter, um, which she thought depicts sunlit water and movement, but it implies goldfish. And she claimed the two together provided an excellent contrast between East and West. Terry Frost was a friend of Manton's and was appointed Gregory Fellow in painting at the University of Leeds in 1954. Manton acquired his works just to find her purchases by stating that the university of all places should take steps to help the young understand the world. And she described the gulf of incomprehension experienced by herself and many others at the university and when first confronted with his work. 
She was impressed by his superb colour sense, visible form and distance, and she explicitly didn't always choose artworks that she found aesthetically pleasing. This was because, she stated, I felt and feel that you like what you understand and you understand what you know. And for the final example of Manson's artworks, we have here Matisse's Snowflowers, which she had a print of and is now part of her collection over at Lancaster Gallery. This was hung next to an electron micrograph, which Manson explained was because it depicted similar forms to Matisse's work. In the late 1940s, Matisse turned almost exclusively to what he described as cutting directly into colour or drawing with scissors, which was the process of producing as cutouts. He would cut brightly coloured painted sheets into a variety of shapes, including plants and animals, and then arrange them into lively compositions. And Manson recalled how one visitor to Botany House once mistook this work by Matisse for one of her micrographs. He was shown a photograph of plant mitochondria next to this cutout and left muttering about the mad professor at the University of Leeds who colours her micrographs, cuts them up and sticks them onto bits of paper. Okay, so now that we know a bit more about Manson's collection and her interest in art, we can return to her term, Other Ways of Looking at Nature, and her view that art, like science, is a tool for comprehending the world. She used this phrase in her piece called The Origins of the Collection. This was a guide to the art displayed at Botany House and was written in 1967. And a shared sentiment can be found in what's considered one of the most important texts in 20th century analytic aesthetics, which is Nelson Goodman's 1968 book, Languages of Art. Goodman argues, the arts must be taken no less seriously than the sciences as modes of discovery, creation and enlargement of knowledge in the broad sense of advancement of the understanding. And many of us, I think, will agree that at least some art has the capacity to increase our knowledge or understanding. And we can maintain this without thinking, of course, that um, this is art's sole purpose. So we value artworks for their beauty or their emotive appeal or um, their artistic creativity. But engaging with works of art, and especially great or challenging works like the ones that Manton owned, um, provides the opportunity to explore new ways of seeing the world and to understand our place within it. But we need to ask, in what way can art cultivate insight? And, given the differences between art and science, can it truly be said that art teaches us in a similar way to science? Well, to think about this question, we need to look at the notion of representation, which is a key commonality between these two practices and one that philosophers have been exploring. So science increases our knowledge of the world through representations. Theories and models like the double helix model of DNA or the general theory of relativity and the Bohr model of the atom represent their subject matter. Models and theories allow us to discover and learn about features of the objects and systems in the world that they stand for. But does representation cover the same idea in the case of art as it does in the case of science? An initial worry might be captured by saying that science is a practice that aims at truth, whereas art distorts and therefore cannot convey any insight. In The Republic, Plato attacks the idea that we can learn from art, stating that the art of representation is something that has no serious value. For Plato, art has the power to corrupt and distort our knowledge because it appeals to our emotional capacities rather than our rational ones, and more importantly, it takes us away from truth. And it was for this reason that Plato thought that painters, sculptors and poets should all be banned from the ideal state. He thought that artists' representations serve only to mislead. But Catherine Elgin, a philosopher at Harvard University, points out that representation in science often requires intentional departures from resemblance to what's being represented as well. Scientific models and theories involve distortion and simplification. So scientists talk of frictionless planes or perfectly rational agents in economic models or ideal gases. And therefore, they deviate from the way the world truly is. So if this is okay for science, then Elgin claims this is also okay for art. And this isn't merely heuristic either. It's an indispensable part of acquiring scientific understanding. So this is captured nicely when Elgin, um, with reference to William James, states, to replicate reality would simply be to reproduce the blooming, buzzing confusion that confronts us. What's the value in that? 
Our goal should be to make sense of things, to structure, synthesise, organise and orient ourselves towards things that serve our ends. So to understand how Elgin thinks this is done, we need to turn to hers and Goodman's term, exemplification. So a simple example of this are paint sample cards. They exemplify the property of interest, which is the colour of paint, um, in the following sense. They both have and refer to that property. They are used to represent what your wall will look like if you choose the corresponding paint colour. But the sample card doesn't exemplify all of the features it possesses. Exemplification is selective. Uh, the property is exemplified depends on the context within which the sample is being used. So colour and a matte or a glossy finish are relevant to the systems used when you're decorating your wall, um, but not the size and the shape of the card. And exemplification plays an important role in representation. So, sorry, you need to look at these for a minute. Um, so, the reason why I'm showing you these is because political cartoons or caricatures are a great example of what Elgin has in mind when she argues that successful representation often requires a departure from resemblance. So, here we have a picture of President Donald Trump um, represented as a giant angry baby and a picture of Theresa May represented as a dragon. So focusing on the Trump example, the picture portrays him as immature and um, temperamental and this is done in the following way. So the picture shows us a baby and this representation metaphorically rather than literally instantiates an array of baby properties and among these immaturity and being temperamental or prone to tantrums um, is highlighted. And so the picture exemplifies these properties. They instantiate them and they refer to them. And finally, these qualities are attributed to Trump himself. So the pictures both denote their subject matter and represent them in a way that conveys a certain message. These are false depictions of their objects in that they're not um, literally true, but by introducing distortion, the pictures allow us to learn something about Trump and May's personalities and political life. Okay, so let's think, how does this work in art? So here we have um, Thomas Gainsborough's Mr. and Mrs. Andrews and Paolo Rigo's The Fitting. Gainsborough's portrait represents Mr. and Mrs. Andrews not as a couple in nature, but as proud landowners. Um, and they're depicted, so they're depicted celebrating their private property. And Gainsborough represents them in this way to reveal certain aspects of their character, class and lives. Paolo Rigo represents... Um, a bridal dress fitting as a nightmare. The painting is surreal, it's quite creepy, and therefore it prescribes us to think about marriage in a certain way. It offers us a new perspective. So the idea is that works of art reorient us, enabling us to see things differently from the way that we saw them before. And they bring to the surface aspects of what's depicted, which without art would be overlooked, and therefore art can enlighten us about how we may understand the world. So now we can look at representation as in science. So for example, the solar system model represents the planets as perfect spheres. DNA molecules are represented as a double helix. Or the model of the nucleus represents the nucleus as a drop of liquid. And it's by virtue of the representation's artificial nature, its departure from the phenomena it seeks to explain, that we learn about significant features of the world. So take the example of the ideal gas model, um, which was discussed by Stephen in Lecture 5 of the series. It accounts for the behaviour of gases by describing the behaviour of a gas composed of dimensionless spherical mole molecules that are not subject to friction and exhibit no intermolecular attraction. But there is no ideal gas and there could be no ideal gas. Yet scientists set out to understand the behaviour of actual gases by reference to this law. The ideal gas exemplifies features that exist but are hard to discern in actual gases. And so the use of idealisation allows us access to those features and for us to explore them and their consequences by leaving out the complications that overshadow the features in real cases. So here the interdependence of the values of temperature, pressure and volume is exemplified. Okay, so to summarise Goodman and Elgin's account then, Scientists and artists select and isolate features of the object or situation represented. They manipulate their representations with the intention of making particular features salient. 
This distancing or departure from truth is not merely pragmatic, but is essential to the representation, and this pushes us um, towards a certain way of understanding the target. So this is one attempt at providing a unified account of how representations in art and science advance understanding. And to end, I want to consider a couple of important differences that should be kept in mind when philosophers are drawing connections between representation in art and science. So the first is raised by Roman Frigg and James Wynne at LSE um, in a forthcoming volume called Thinking About Science, Reflecting on Art. And this is a collection of papers exploring connections between aesthetics and philosophy of science and is co-edited by our very own Stephen French. Um, Frigg and Wynne have formed their own account of representation that develops Elgin and Goodman's work but they pointed out a significant difference between art and science, and this is the degree of flexibility in the interpretation of representations. Um, and the difference might be to do with the fact that models and theories are designed to simplify their targets by, say, um, ignoring friction or pretending that agents in an economic model are perfectly rational. But artworks often present us with the complexity of things. So in scientific cases, the content of the representation is usually fixed by the context, and this means the interpretation is largely constrained. Someone who, for example, when looking at the model of the solar system um, and does not interpret the largest sphere as the sun, does, doesn't understand the model. To say that it represents something else is simply false. But in artworks, there's often more flexibility and the example they give is works of literature, but I think the same can be said for visual art. So to demonstrate this, if we think again of Picasso, and in particular his painting Guernica, the masterpiece is created in 1937 in response to the bombing of Guernica, a village in the Basque region of Spain during the Spanish Civil War. On one hand, we can say that the painting represents the concrete pain and death of the inhabitants of Guernica, but it's also important to recognise that the Basque region was a um, hugely symbolic area of democracy during the war and therefore the, the painting represents something more abstract, it represents the threat and the rise of fascism. And it's often used now as a reminder of the horror and um, futility and destructive power of, more, of war more generally. A different interpretation might focus on the fact that the majority of the town's men were away fighting for the Republicans and therefore most of the victims were women and children and this is reflected in the painting. So we could bring a feminist perspective and state that it represents the war against women, women and the violence that they face whether um, in wartime or in their domestic lives as well as the devastation of Mother Earth. Or finally, some have homed in on the candle in the centre of the painting as a reminder that there's light and hope, even in the darkest of times, so it acts as a sign of resistance. So the point being that the ambiguity means that multiple interpretations can be brought to the work and different aspects of the work can be attended to to support these interpretations. So finally, a second difference is the importance of form and style in artistic representations. Gregory Curry, a philosopher at York University, argues that unlike works of art, scientific models are not dependent for their value in learning on any particular formulation. Well, what does he mean by this? Well, artworks are admired not just for their content, but for their formal properties and artistic skill. For example, Guernica doesn't just represent some or all of those things that I outlined, but it expresses them in a certain way. So it has a carefully constructed but chaotic composition with humans and animals jumbled together. It's painted in monochrome colours of grey, black and white. And it has a fractured, fragmented style. And this plays a huge part in the way that the work teaches us about what it represents. These formal properties themselves express the horror of war. Artworks are, to use Curry's phrase, dependent for their value in learning on their formulation. So in response, Frigg and Wen point out that formulation also matters in scientific representations. The very same model, when presented under a different format, can yield different predictions and offer different explanations. And further to this, it can be argued that it's worth paying more attention to the aesthetic considerations that scientists make when forming their theories and models, and how the formal properties of a representation alter and improve our understanding and therefore contribute to the theory or model's representational success. 
This is an issue that Milena Ivanova's looked at in a recent Philosophy Compass article and a little plug here, it's the theme of a philosophy conference we're having here in July called Aesthetics of Science which is organised by Milena and Stephen and um, Catherine Elgin is one of the speakers. So the thought is that the importance of form and style is a matter of a difference in degree rather than in kind but still I think there are important dissimilarities that need attending to when highlighting commonalities in representation in art and science. Okay, and I'll now pass on to Stephen who's going to talk about another way in which philosophers can explore the connections between art and science and this is by looking at observation. Brilliant. Okay. Thanks Alice. Okay. Okay, so Alice has very nicely uh, discussed one commonality between uh, art and science, representation or representation as. Another uh, common feature of both art and science is the notion of observation. And this, of course, was critical for, uh, I, to understand Irene Manton's work and uh, her success. If you... You know, if you go on Google and look at you know, quotes of, of artists, you find reference to observation um, from many artists. Um, here's Delacroix. Seeing artistically does not happen automatically. We must constantly develop our powers of observation. And that's actually going to be one of the themes I want to address and explore in the remaining part of this talk. Seeing artistically or scientifically does not just happen. Okay? doesn't happen automatically. It's something that has to be developed. Okay? And we also have here a quote from Van Gogh, art demands constant observation. Likewise in science, it's, it's easy in the history of science to find quotes uh, from great scientists and not so great scientists uh, on observation. Here's Thomas Huxley, science is simply common sense, quite a contentious perhaps statement for some people. At its best, that is, rigidly accurate in observation, merciless to fallacy in logic. Here's Galileo, modern observations deprive all former writers of any authority, since if they had seen what we see, they would have judged as we judge. Who is he referring to there? The likes of Aristotle. This marks one of the turning points of the scientific revolution when scientists turn their backs on the scholastic study of the greats and instead began to depend on their own observations. And here we have Galileo with his telescope and I'll be coming back to that briefly um, in a second. Um, and here we have Alan Sokal, uh, a scientist and commentator on science Science relies on publicly reproducible sense experience, that is experiments and observations, combined with rational reflection on those empirical observations. Now that emphasis on sense experience is often taken to mark science. It is sense experience that is claim to be the bedrock of science. We observe through our senses. They are, if not infallible, at least uh, solid, secure uh, foundations for knowledge. Okay? And indeed, uh, you find that expressed, that sentiment expressed by certain philosophers and commentators of science, notably Baz van Fraassen. If you ask, if you think, well, what is an observation? He's clear. Whoops, sorry. Uh, an observation is an unaided act of perception. Unaided. Okay? Calculating the mass of a particle from the deflection of its trajectory in a magnetic field is not an observation. Okay? You infer the mass. Here we have, I think this is a beta particle in a magnetic field. And from the curvature of the track, you can deduce its, its mass. Now, you might think, well, that's quite a hard line uh, to take. Um, and this is partly what I'm going to be uh, exploring and talking about over the next 10 minutes or so. But Van Frassen is clear. An observation for him is an unaided act of perception. Okay? And this raises the question then, well, in that sense, do we observe through microscopes? Now, scientists may say, yes, of course we do. We observe we're using all kinds of instruments. Van Frassen, the philosopher, is going to say, well, hold on a minute there. Okay? Let's be clear about what's going on. Okay? Now, uh, Claire and Yuha talked about this in the uh, fourth lecture on the microscope. 
is an example. In, an earlier, in the earlier slide, I, have, uh, I had a picture here of a uh, hook and his sort of very elementary uh, microscope. And here's one of the things that Hook observed, the flea, beautiful drawings uh, that Hook produced. And you might say, well, hang on a minute. Um, clearly, this is a good representation of the flea. Okay? Clearly, um, Hook here is accurately representing this object. Well, the likes of Van Frassen is going to say, uh, are we sure about that? You might say, well, yes, look, you know, come on. We see fleas with the naked eye, right? Anyone who has a pet, a dog or a cat, right? You see the little buggers jumping around. Um, and all that Hook has done is to enlarge, magnify, and surely this is an accurate representation of a flea. Well, is it? I mean, can we be sure that these features are actually there on the flea? Can we be sure that everything here is... A property of the object. It's not introduced by the instrument. Can we be certain of that? Oops, sorry. And this is an important issue. I, I, I had the image of Galileo in the telescope, and there's a famous story about Galileo. Um, when he first started observing the moons of Jupiter through the telescope, his colleagues at Padua were supposedly skeptical of his observations. And they're typically, in most sort of popular histories of science, they're typically dismissed as fools, Aristotelians, buffoons. How could they possibly uh, dismiss these observations? But they had a good point, because they asked Galileo, OK, interesting. Can you tell us how this instrument of yours works? Ah, well, no, not really, says Galileo because he didn't have a theory of optics. We didn't have a viable theory of optics until much later with the likes of Huygens and others. Okay. So he wasn't able to uh, appeal to a theory to be able to uh, justify his claim that what he was observing was actually out there. And so Van Frassen continues this perhaps hard line and says actually on his view Right? Microscope observation, because it's, it's not unaided perception, it actually doesn't count as observation. A microscope image, he said, is a public hallucination. Again, you might think, oh, dude, really, that's kind of a, a strong line to take. What does he mean? Well, it's public. He's not saying it's subjective. It's intersubjective. We can all agree on, you know, have a look in the microscope. Oh, yeah, it's a flea. Look at that. Oh, right. We can all agree. But, he says, it is not the case that what we are seeing, the image, is necessarily or clearly or straightforwardly an accurate representation of some object. And he likens this to rainbows, right? Rainbows aren't an image of some object. Sorry to tell some of you, perhaps. There's no pot of gold. There's no beautiful arc actually out there. It's just light refracted, reflected through drops of water. Now, I suspect that many of you, particularly with the science background, are kind of sceptical of Van Frassen's claim, and you might think along these lines. I think Juha touched on this. You might say, look, there's a continuum here. There's a spectrum on which you have the eye and the optical microscope, right? They both appeal to or involve uh, the same part of the electromagnetic spectrum, the visual part of the electromagnetic spectrum. And they both rely on more or less the same processes. It's the eye, you've got a lens, light comes through the lens, it's um, refracted, and uh, uh, creates an image on the back there, on the, uh, what do they call it? I don't know. Retina. There you go. Um, and likewise, a microscope, we've got a lens, we've got light being uh, reflected perhaps off the object, creates an image. It's basically the same kind of process, right? So appealing to that continuum, we might want to say at least through this uh, kind of microscope, an optical microscope, there is a continuum. We can legitimately claim we are observing something. We're observing objects. We're observing. Hooke was observing the, the flea. Likewise with the telescope. Galileo was observing the uh, moons of Jupiter. There's no difference in kind between what's going on there and what's going on with the naked eye. Okay. So what happens when we move on to Manton's observations? And here we have a nice image 
of her ultraviolet microscope. This was a tricky beast to operate. First thing I want to say about it. Okay? It involved both uh, uh, um, uh, light and uh, or, you know, the visual part, electromagnetic spectrum, and the ultraviolet part. It was very difficult to use to get sensible uh, images from. Uh, I think this was the one where the cables would overheat and things would burn up. And it, it was very tricky. But here, as, as Nicola uh, has already presented, is one of the images that Manton produced with this, with this beast. Okay, and here we have the, the cilia. And here we have, well, what are those things? Now, are they actually there in the cell or are they an artifact of this device? Manton herself was concerned about this, okay? And notice what she says, that, that, that they are genuine structures and not a diffraction pattern or flare caused by the cilia being out of focus is proved, among other reasons, by their attitudes. In many places they, do, they diverge widely at the end of the bundle, an appearance which contrasts totally uh, with the strongly marked parallel lines that a cilium generally out of focus actually displays. Okay. Notice what she's doing there. She's not saying, yeah, 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 what you see is what you get. She's not saying, yeah, that's clearly what that image uh, does is represent uh, straightforwardly the object out there. She doesn't say that. You have to put some work into it, right? You need to be basically guided through the image. And she notes this concern. How can we tell that these structures are genuine or not? Okay. It's not just a matter of passive uh, uh, observation. Okay. Oh, sorry, yes. And the second point to note, already we're beginning to swing away from that continuum of vision. Okay. We're beginning to move away from the visual part of the electromagnetic spectrum. She's using ultraviolet light. <coughs> Even more so once she turns to the electron microscope. Constructed by Ernst Rüsker in 1933, I think here's an early example. Theory suggested by Hans Busch in 26, basic idea, instead of light, use electron beams. Instead of glass lenses, use magnetic fields to act as lenses. Okay. It's analogous to light and glass lenses, but the processes are quite different, of course. Okay. And here's, I have to say, a rather dry, technical piece uh, from the Philips laboratory uh, about the Philips 100 kilovolt electron microscope. This, I understand from Nicola, is the one that um, Irene Manton was so keen to get her hands on. It's the first electron microscope that she used. Um, and it's, a, it's um, a transmission electron microscope. There are two kinds, or at least two kinds, transmission and scattering. Transmission, basically, to put it really crudely, you're blasting electrons through the sample. So first of all, it's got to be cut thin enough for the electrons to pass through. And then different parts of that sample, that specimen, will attenuate the beam to a varying ex extent by scattering the electrons more or less. Thus, the beam passing through the specimen carries with it an image of the structure of the specimen. That's the basic idea. Um, and notice this in this very dry, boring, technical piece, the instrument with which one works still demands a great deal of the observer's attention, it being rather more an art than a science to make really good pictures with the electron microscope. Now, I didn't put that in there just because it has the word art and science in the same language. It's like, oh, that's cute. Right? This makes a really important point. You might think instead of art, think of craft. Okay? You need to be a craftsperson to be able to operate these devices. You need a lot of skill, a lot of patience, um, a lot of attention. Okay? And that's what Irene Manton had. I mean, here's just a couple of shots of, I mean, it looks a slightly desolate um, laboratory at this stage. The, you know, the machine's been taken apart. But this was her electron microscope before Botany House was refurbished. It was still there languishing rather sadly. And uh, Graham... Uh, Professor Graham Goodday took these photos. And here's the shadow cast. You can understand why it's called a shadow cast. That uh, she and uh, Brian Clark, her uh, assistant, uh, made using the electron microscope, the first electron microscope, uh, micrograph that they uh, produced. Okay, you can see the um, flagellum here.
as I said, already with the electron microscope, we're swinging away from that continuum of, of, of vision. Once we get to something that I'm sure Irene would have loved to get her hands on, but was uh, uh, invented really too late for her, um, is the atomic force microscope. Once we get to that, we're well off this continuum of spectrum. That doesn't use the electromagnetic spectrum. Uh, uh, well, in a way it does, but we can get into that. But what the, how this works is it takes, a, 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 think of it as a very fine needle, and it runs that across the surface of the sample. And in effect, what it does, it measures the force between the needle and the surface of the sample, or a force. It actually involves lots of different forces. And then by magical process known as science, it turns that into that sort of deviations in, that, in those forces into these images, single polymer chains. Right? And you often see these in the literature. We can now observe the atom. IBM can see you know, individual atoms on the surface. Well, can you? Can you really IBM? What you're doing is taking these measurements with this device and turning them through a very complicated process into these kinds of images. We're now completely a well, you know, well off the spectrum that we were talking about, this continuum of vision. So what's the point? First of all, we have exemplified in the work of Irene Mountain these different processes in play. Um, and we don't have, I think we can, we, it can be argued, this continuum of vision. In these different processes, we have to appeal to different theories and models to understand what is going on. With optical microscopes and telescopes, the theory of optics. Okay, that's reasonably well-known, straightforward. Actually, it isn't. It's really interesting how, how they work. But we can, again, we can talk about that some other time. Electron microscopes. Theories of electron transmission and scattering. Basically, it's going to come down to quantum mechanics. Atomic force uh, microscopes. Again, the theories of various forces. It's going to come down to... to it all comes down to quantum mechanics, unfortunately. Um, the point is, what we have here is, fancy word, the mediation of theory and models between the sample and the image. It is not the case that you are straightforwardly representing with your image the sample. There's a lot that's stacked in there, theory uh, and models. That's the first point. And the second is, as I said before, there's, as, the, as the technicians at Philips said, there's an art to, to, to using these instruments or a craft. Okay. Here's part of it, preparation, just to get the sample ready, right, for you to make your observations. It has to be fixed with chemicals, stained with iodine. It has to be transferred, right, dried onto slides. And then this bit, right, it has to be floated off onto a water meniscus. Those of us who are old enough and sad enough to remember Airfix kits, and those transfers, the little RAF roundels, and remember, float them off in a little source of water, and you have to get them on there, and the old oh, bugger, I've split it, it's folded, I've got it in the wrong place. Imagine doing that with a carefully prepared biological sample. Right? Brian Clark did a lot of this work. It's very careful work, very delicate work. It involves a great deal of skill just to get this thing loaded into the electron microscope for Irene then to operate and produce these wonderful images. Recall what Van Frassen said. These images that microscopes produce are public hallucinations. They are, he says, intersubjectively observable, but they are not images of things any more than a rainbow is. But perhaps that's focusing on the wrong issue. Here's a different way, a better way perhaps, of looking at this. Ask the question, what does the content of the images amount to? And here, Otavio Bueno, a former PhD student of ours here at Leeds, makes a nice distinction between what he calls the object-oriented component, what the image is about, and the experience-oriented component, what the image is like. Okay? Here's famous Picasso painting, Portrait of Dora Maar, his lover and muse, object-oriented content. What's it about? It's about Dora Maar. Okay? Experience-oriented content. If this is what Dora Maar would be like from a cubist perspective. This is an attempt to capture the three-dimensionality of Dora Maar. Here's a shadow cast of a, and here's where my Latin fails me, a sphagnum acutifolium, spermatozoid. Right? 
That's what this image is about with all the cilia. Okay? And the experience-oriented content tells us what the, the spermatozoid is like as observed via a transmitted electron beam. Okay? How do those two aspects of the content of the image, how are they brought together? How do they come to be related? Again, you know, fancy kind of philosophical terms, by negotiation, what does that mean? By practically negotiating the mediation of theory and models that lie between them. You've got to understand the, theory of model, uh, the theories and models involved. You've got to understand how the instrument works. You've got to be able to justify your claim that this part of the image represents that part of some object. But this other part doesn't. Right? It's not a straightforward process. It involves a lot of toing and froing, a lot of iteration. In the case of Picasso's painting and Manton and Clark's images, the upshot is that you may then be able to justify the claim that certain relations in the image represent going back to Alice's part of the talk, represent certain relations in the object or the sample. And Manton, Irene Manton, was brilliant at doing that. She was brilliant at negotiating, as it were, that process. And Brian Ledbetter in his obituary says, she had a flair for visualizing and interpreting structural images, an aspect of her personality that also attracted her to the interpretation of oriental and abstract art which she collected. And here to finish off, I'll just, is this another beautiful image uh, that Manton produced, and then some sculptures uh, inspired uh, and uh, produced by Austin Wright, inspired by her images. And I'll leave that there. Thank you very much.